My name is Resonance22, and welcome to my tutorial for Armello, a very unique indie strategy game. In this video, I'll explain the game, how to play, the flow of a match, the mechanics, and give a super brief review at the end. Armello is a turn-based strategy game, with tactical card play, tabletop strategy, and RPG elements. Think Game of Thrones, the books, meets Settlers of Catan. Armello is an elaborate political game of adventure, sabotage, risky alliances, and near total freedom and strategy. The goal of each match is to find a way to become the next king of Armello, while ensuring that all the other players don't succeed in their own plans. Since there are four different ways to win, and so many characters and variables to factor in, this can get complicated very fast. Whether or not Armello is the game for you, I think it's fascinating to explore its concepts, as it's undoubtedly a very unique experience. It has quickly become one of my favorite games of all time, and what makes it so interesting to play is that it has an extremely complicated set of strategies and mechanics. So today, I'll be breaking down the basics of Armello. So in Armello, four players take control of a single character which is selected at the start of the game. There's a pretty broad roster here, each with their own assortment of different stats and unique abilities. Wolf Clan characters generally fight their opponents directly. The Rat Clan generally fights dirty. The Rabbit Clan prefers to win diplomatically. And the Bear Clan prefers to win via casting spells. Honestly, pick whatever character you'd like, and don't hesitate to try each of them and alternate. The central game mode is always four players, and these can either be controlled by AI, friends, or online players via matchmaking. Once the match starts, the camera pans over to show the King of Armello. He's the main objective that players will contest in the center of the map. The story is that the King has become corrupted by the Rot, a dark magic that is slowly turning him evil and subsequently increasing his power. But also, after ten turns, he will succumb to the Rot and die, ending the game. In the meantime, the king's tyranny is becoming a huge problem for the citizens of Armello, and so it's up to you to stop him. This brings us to the four ways that you can win a game. The first way is by defeating the king in combat, thus ending his reign of terror, and then you ascend to the throne of Armello, hopefully becoming a more just ruler than him. However, defeating the king in combat is no simple feat, as his palace is heavily guarded by both dark magic and a legion of king's guards. One way to make that easier would be to embrace the dark side and willingly become corrupted by rot. While having a bit of rot is bad, having a lot of rot grants you an insane boost in combat, and is even more effective if you have more rot than your opponent. Since the king is also corrupted, should you become more evil than him, then you should be able to make short work of his guards and then take him down, which is the second win condition. After that, you'll become the new proud tyrant of Armello. The third way that you can win is by traveling across the lands to collect four or more spirit stones. Once you collect four, you become a holy spirit walker who can cleanse the souls of the corrupted. If you wish to be the good guy and save the king of Armello, you can choose to purify him, giving him a chance to repent before his soul is banished away. Spirit Walkers don't have to fight the King, and can rest easy knowing that the Kingdom has been saved from the Scourge of Rot. The fourth way that you can win is by having the most prestige points, which you get from being a good citizen and completing quests, defeating monsters, slaying those dastardly other players who are plotting to take the throne, and by not being criminal scum. Break the law or die for any reason, and you lose one point of prestige. You lose all of your prestige if you attack the King, since it's treason then. Getting a prestige victory is about protecting the king, and keeping other players out of the palace. One perk of being the prestige leader is that you get to declare new terrible laws every other turn. These laws are actually bad for everyone, including yourself, but there's a big benefit of being able to pick your poison, so to speak. If you manage to hold the most prestige when the king dies of <laughs> natural or unnatural causes, then as his favorite subject, you will ascend to the throne of Armello as his successor thus winning the game. You can play however you want, and win however you want. That's up to you, 
and no two games ever feel the same. That's because there are just so many different mechanics and moving parts to Armello. Every match, as I often say since I love good strategy games, feels like a new puzzle to solve. Part of this is a result of the game's many random elements, such as dice, card draws, quest rewards, and board layouts. You'd think that this would turn the game into a complete circus where your choices don't matter, but the game is extremely well designed in this regard. While RNG will shift the tides, the better player usually wins, and this becomes apparent once you pass a high enough skill threshold in Armello. The general idea is that the random elements add much needed variety to each game and encourage creative problem solving. They are also necessary to always give your friends and yourself a way out, something that keeps everyone playing until the very end. That weird hand of cards that you drew is telling you something, and it's up to you to make it work. Armello is a game where you have to adapt. I think that's what I didn't understand about it at first. You can't come into the start of any game with a plan. You have to see what the board layout looks like, your hand is, where your quests are, what their rewards are, and constantly adapt your strategy to the changing situation. Once you understand that sometimes it really do be like that and learn to roll with the punches, you'll start winning. If you give it a chance, I'm pretty confident that most of you would either like the game, or at least appreciate its interesting quirks. Still though, if you dislike board games, and or generally prefer little to no randomness in your games, then I think it's fair to pass an Armello. I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. This game has a surprising amount of depth to it, but there's still significant variance. Personally, I keep coming back to Armello, because in every single match, I always find a new creative way to win or lose that I've never even thought of. It's extremely entertaining, and this is a result of the sheer variety and interactions of the game's many mechanics. It's a really fascinating game, so whether or not it's for you, I always find it entertaining to both watch and play. Alright, now that I've provided some context, let's jump back to the gameplay. During character select, we are introduced to the stat system. The four primary character stats are Fight, which is how many dice you get during combat rolls, Body, which is your health, Wits, which is your maximum hand size, and Spirit, which is your maximum mana for casting spells. Players can also bring a ring and amulet with them, offering a small stat boost and an additional passive effect. These offer a bit of player customization, and are easily unlocked through both single player and multiplayer. Once the game begins, each player starts in a different corner of the map, spawning in their respective clan grounds, a safe zone where they cannot be targeted. At the start of the match, every player can pick their quest immediately, regardless of turn order. There's usually something to do when it's not your turn, which is a welcome feature. Now for quests, there are always three options, each with their own unique rewards and stat challenges. Let me explain that a bit. Those four character stats that I mentioned earlier can each be permanently increased if you complete a quest that challenges that specific stat. You also receive plus one prestige point, one of the currencies used as a victory condition. To complete the quest, you must venture toward the tile that it spawns on. These are randomly selected, but have a generally consistent distance to them. For example, the first quest is always extremely close to you, just whether or not it's on the left or right side of you will be different each time. The second quest is usually quite far away, and all subsequent quests will encourage you to walk around the map. Note that the other players can't know the location of your quests, unless they have a specific item, spell, or follower that lets them do it, usually with the scout keyword. This allows you to do some pretty interesting mind games with your opponents. Once you reach the tile that your quest has highlighted, you have the option of either taking the reward or risking an optional challenge for an additional reward. The default reward for every quest is associated with what stat the challenge challenges. For example, a wits challenge, which it specifies at the bottom, will permanently add plus one wits to your character regardless of whether or not you actually pass the skill test. You get the boost just for making it to that tile. You also get that plus one prestige. However, if you want to risk it, you can test that skill for an additional extra reward, which we saw on the Choose a Quest screen earlier. The chances of passing the test are 10% per stat point that you currently have. So if I had 5 fight and did a fight challenge, I'd have a 50% chance of passing. You can also see the penalty for failing the test before you take it. And usually these are quite lenient for the first quest. And yes, this means you can buff a stat first to improve your odds. Now, how would you know which quest to take at the start? What does a hero truly need? 
That is for you to decide, and every game I recommend experimenting with different strategies based off the rewards that you see and the character that you are playing. Sometimes it's helpful to use quests as a way to shore up stats that your character is naturally quite weak in. Other times it may be useful to stack a certain stat into absurdity and just end someone's career. One aspect that might help you decide is better understanding what each of these stats actually do and what they are required for. And to do that, I have to move on to what happens after selecting a quest. It's time to draw some cards! At the start of every turn, you draw cards up to your maximum hand size, which is determined by your wit stat. You don't draw one card every turn. You keep drawing until you're at the max hand size, and if your hand is already full, then you draw nothing. That makes wits an incredibly useful stat to have, since more cards means more options all the time. This is a reasonable segue into the cards themselves. There are three different decks that each have a set number of each card in them, and every player draws from the same three decks. From top to bottom, we have the item card deck in yellow, the spell deck in green, the trickery deck in red. You get to choose which deck to draw from for every individual draw, so there's a lot of player customization in there. Items are either equipment or consumables, both of which cost gold to use. Each character can wear up to three pieces of equipment, which provide a boost to their stats and or a passive effect in battle or on the overworld. When you're starting out, I generally recommend getting at least one piece of equipment as soon as possible, so that you don't get obliterated by everything you encounter. Spells from the spell deck cost magic, another currency in the bottom right of the screen. Every turn the game shifts from dawn to dusk. Every dusk, your magic pool is restored to the same number as your spirit stat. Having higher spirit has a couple of other benefits too, such as having increased cast range on some spells and better chances of escaping some trap cards. The Red Trickery deck are all trap cards, or interesting debuff effects. By trap cards I mean you can play some trickery cards to a space on the map, which is visible to everyone, and if a player steps on it, then they have to pass a skill test or face whatever terrible price the card shows. A skilled player will use trickery cards to block off valuable spaces or force a player to move around them in an awkward way. Now, both spells and trickery cards can be played to the board in some cases, and the skill test depends on that type of card. Trickery cards test your opponent's wit stat, while spells test your opponent's spirit stat. Having higher of these associated skills will help you pass through these perils with fewer problems. Conversely, a character with a tiny brain like Fang will really struggle with spell perils. Fang prefers to smash people, and not waste his time solving magical riddles or bribing guards. Some trickery, item, and spell cards can be played directly to a player to put some sort of effect on them, and some of these can even be played during the other player's turn. I don't have clips of every spell or trickery, but one example is Moonbite just deals damage to someone, and an extra point of damage if it's night. Some of my favorite trickery cards are the packs, and this is where the political side of our mellow really comes into play. There's a trickery card that gives you and an opponent of your choice plus one extra gold income per turn until either of you dies. These allow you to force an alliance on someone who might not want it, leading to some hilarious situations. In addition, circumstances may arise where you need to end that alliance prematurely, because the other player is benefiting from it more than you are. Other players may also try to snipe one of you to prevent you both from pulling ahead while you two have to protect each other. I love the dynamic that this encourages. Anyway, moral of the story is that higher wits and higher spirit helps you pass cards that are played to the board. That jerk king in the center of the map will also play perils to the board every other turn, so it's risky to have lopsided stats without a proper strategy. An item or spell that grants scout will allow you to see the perils effect, what symbols are required to pass it, as well as preventing characters from evading you in combat. Now before we talk about combat in the two remaining stats, I have to talk about movement first. Every character can take three actions per turn, and these include either moving or attacking. Mountains provide a defense boost in combat, but like in many strategy games, they cost two action points to move onto. What's super interesting about this system is that the game actually allows you to attack the same target three times in a turn if you want to, or three different targets. Whether or not that's a good idea in practice will 100% depend on the situation, and it's endlessly entertaining. 
finding the right balance between movement and offense is always fun. So let's say you finally limp your way across the map, and either fortunately or unfortunately stumble into an enemy player, a Kingsguard, or a Bane. This will cost you one action point, and then the combat phase begins. An extremely cool battle intro will play, which never gets old, and you'll get to enjoy some great character art. The presentation on this screen is excellent, and sets the tone for the fight. Speaking of fight, in every battle, players will receive a quantity of dice equivalent to their fight stat, as well as any additional modifiers from their equipment. For example, a King's Guard carries a special halberd, which reduces the amount of dice that you get by one. Dice rolls can have six possible outcomes, but these are no normal dice. These are our mellow dice. There's a sword symbol which grants you an attack, a shield symbol which grants you a block, and the rest is kinda complicated. Basically, you get one action per dice, and it's either registered as an attack, a block, a miss, or an extra dice roll. Obviously, having more dice is a good thing, especially if you plan to bully people or clean out those pesky veins. So a high fight stat is very valuable for some characters. Other characters can either compensate with equipment or through spells, trickeries, and being generally resistant to perils. Another interesting aspect of combat is how players can burn cards from their hand to guarantee specific dice rolls that match the symbol on that card. This makes battles way more consistent, and rewards player skill because you have to gauge how many symbols you need, and if you'd rather have that card's overworld effect later. Anyway, burning a moon or sun will either count as a miss or hit, a tree or wild symbol, is an extra dice roll, unless you've got five or more rot and become corrupted. For normal do-gooders, a rot is a miss, but for corrupted heroes, it's an extra dice roll, and the wild symbol becomes a miss instead. The amount of total extra dice rolls that you can get is capped at either your spirit or rot stat, which limits the swinginess of combat, and we call that your explode pool. I should note that players gain rot by cycling through the item and spell decks for cards that grant rot purposely triggering specific perils that grant rot, selecting specific quest lines and quest rewards, intentionally dying to banes, defeating banes, and through a series of equally elaborate shenanigans. Fun fact, if you're at 4 rot and simultaneously die and defeat a bane in one single round of combat, that's plus 2 rot and not plus 1. Having a bit of rot is quite bad though, as I've mentioned, and that if you have fewer rot than another character with more rot, then your would-be extra dice are instead added to their pile in combat. This does buff Banes, and it does buff the King. In addition, evildoers take one damage every dawn, and fully corrupted heroes don't heal from stone circle tiles. They instead get smited and instantly evaporate. Heroic players get to avoid this downside, and are also generally less vulnerable to spells. So a Kingslayer victory as a good guy puts most of the challenge in the final epic battle against the King. Meanwhile, a Rot victory puts most of the challenge in the journey itself, since a more corrupted hero gets extra dice from the king during that fight, dice that would otherwise go to him. There are also many ways to tip the scales in your favor, both when attempting regicide and when dealing with meddling players, by making strategic use of the terrain, buff cards, damage cards, equipment, and an actual trick during the fight itself. A general tip for combat is that if you need to not die, Burn a shield card to guarantee that you get exactly the amount of blocks that you need. If you need to kill someone, burning a sword card to guarantee that you get exactly the amount of attacks in that you need is quite helpful. Characters like Thane even get a special bonus for burning sword cards in combat. Burning a card means that you don't get to use its effect on the overworld, but it also means that you get to draw new cards the next turn. Very skilled players will strategically burn cards that they don't need to sway the tide of combat but they also may burn cards that they don't need in a battle or peril that they can afford to lose. Interestingly, you can also burn cards in your hand in perils as well to guarantee specific dice rolls there. Not only does having a higher wit stat mean more cards to burn, but it also grants you more dice and trickery perils too. Spirit is quite useful too though, as spirit adds to your dice count in spell perils, lets you cast more spells, and in some cases, it even approves their effects as well. Let's talk money for a moment. Armello has plenty of replay value because there is so much depth to its individual systems. There's even an economy in the game. Every character starts with a different amount of gold, and equipping or using items costs gold. You can get more gold by exploring dungeons. These are special tiles that offer a variety of rewards, and a small chance for a penalty, such as spawning a hostile bane. 
Banes are big scary bird monsters that attack non-corrupted heroes. Defeating them rewards you with plus one prestige, since you're helping make the land a safer place. Consequently, defeating a Kingsguard, who always seems to be inconveniently blocking your way, will make you lose one prestige. You can also secure gold income by capturing settlements. Settlements are specific tiles on the board that are dotted with houses and are captured by stepping on them. They generate one gold every dawn and are absolutely essential to winning the game for most characters. You can also take settlements that are owned from an opposing player, swinging the gold income in your favor. There are some cards that allow you to fortify a settlement, making it require two action points to enter that tile, but just one for yourself. The character Alicia will fortify any settlement that she herself ends her turn on. I recommend making sure that you own one settlement whenever possible, as long as you still need gold and it won't distract you from your current objective. Yeesh, this game is complicated, but that's what makes it so interesting to me. So looping back to those King's Guards, attacking one will also put a bounty on your head, and there are a few other ways to accumulate a bounty by just generally breaking the law. Having a bounty means that King's Guards who were previously neutral will now attack you on sight. This causes a rather entertaining snowball effect, where once you become a criminal, it's difficult to escape that cycle without playing cards like a royal pardon. If a player defeats you and you have a bounty, then you've been brought to justice, and they get a ton of gold which scales with your bounty level. Once defeated, your bounty will reset, and you can pretend like nothing happened. <laughs> this is also a great segue into dying. In Armello, it's important to keep in mind that you're going to die. A lot. And that's normal. Every game of Armello is absolute chaos, and that's the fun of it. Players will accidentally enter into a life of crime, inadvertently become the hero that saves the town, join the dark side, then join the light side, and then someone blows you up, starting the cycle over again. The game is never over until the last turn, so keep on adapting, and you'll succeed. At this point, I'm going to assume that the runtime for this video is about three hours, so I'll try and wrap things up. Some general tips for new players are, one, almost always complete your first quest, two, almost always get at least one piece of equipment, if not more. Three, probably don't fight anyone or anything until either after your first quest, or if you have some kind of equipment or card to turn the tide. Four, generally don't try to breach the king's palace until he has about four to three hearts remaining. You won't survive. You also need a bit of a buffer to make sure that you have a couple turns to breach, and you should bring a wide variety of card symbols in your hand drawn from different decks. Five, don't be a little bit evil. Either go full evil or avoid rot like the plague. <laughs> this is because at 5 rot you become all powerful, and below that it's a rather huge inconvenience. 6. Always adapt. You can't go into a game of Armello with a pre-planned victory scenario. You'll need to determine that based off your first few quests, the opposing characters, loadouts, your starting hand, and what happens during the first couple of turns. I can't tell you how many times I've had a plan, and then suddenly the game gives me an early Bane Blade, and I guess I'm being evil this game. If you get a Bane Blade, perhaps it's time to reconsider your ethical dilemmas. Unless it's late enough in the game that you won't get that much value out of it, that does happen too. 7. Conversely, later in the game, you really want to refine your victory strategy. Leave all doors open, but make sure you actually have something lined up for you. 8. Sometimes things won't go your way, and that's fine. Keeping a level head is a recipe for success. 9. Armello is extremely complicated, and while easy to learn, has an absurdly high skill ceiling. At first you'll probably be lost, and that's fine. Practicing with AI and playing with friends is a good way to learn, and I'll do more videos to help you as well. As you play more, remember to never stop learning, to continue experimenting with new strategies and interactions, and to of course, enjoy yourself. Your typical game of Armello flows like this. Game starts, King roars, and players pick their quests. Then, players all go to complete their first quest, and maybe things get messy on the way. Everyone at this point should have at least one piece of equipment and hopefully one settlement. After that, chaos ensues. Players are now forced to walk across the map, and sometimes, someone will be in your way. And that's just unfortunate for them. Wrong time, wrong place. After the second quest, player strategies will start to become more refined, and their stats will be considerably stronger. Someone might have two spirit stones, so might want to watch out for a potential spirit stone victory and deny them that. Someone might be pulling ahead in prestige too, 
but you still have plenty of time to stop that before it gets out of hand. Someone might be flirting with Chancellor Palpatine, and it's not too late to kick them before they become the next Sith Lord. Someone might also be gearing up to breach the palace, and you still have time to halt their momentum. Near the end of a match, once the king approaches three health, it becomes a race for the throne. Everyone but the prestige leader needs to breach the palace, and that one guy in the corner who somehow completed literally all of his quests, that guy gets free palace entry. The prestige leader can't usually sit idly by either, since his slash her victory condition is ensuring that none of you get into the palace and either save or kill the king. It becomes an all-out brawl, where respawning and making a beeline for the middle is pretty common. In addition, the king is protected by four perils, two of which will test your wits, and two that test your spirit stat. Completing all five of your quests, which takes forever and is not always advisable, does give you free palace entry though, so it's a possible win condition in itself. These perils are super difficult to pass, and generally require multiple attempts while steadily weakening you. Buffing your wits or spirit stats can certainly help, and you'll generally want to burn a couple of cards to ensure that you pass. Alternatively, why do so much hard work if someone else can just do it for you? Sure, it's risky, but you could always just let someone breach the palace first, removing the peril, and then subsequently assassinate them, and then take their path into the palace later. What makes Armello so great is the sheer volume of interesting interactions and scenarios that they create. I have played so much Armello, and yet honestly, it never gets old. Every game, I see something completely different, and I'm consistently forced to think on my feet. That's why I keep coming back for another round. Sure, there's a bit of randomness, but I think that's the joy of it. It encourages creative problem solving, and is generally utilized quite well. Now, what can get old is the general lack of infrastructure surrounding the game. Armello is great, but occasionally crashes, disconnects, and freezes are not the kind of exciting tension that I enjoy. At least I'm used to it from Age of Empires 2. Both great games. Thankfully, there is a reliable reconnect feature in patch 2.0, but as of this recording, the Switch version crashes pretty consistently in almost every match. In addition, every version of Armello lacks crossplay and is on a different patch, which makes for a rather inconsistent and sometimes barren multiplayer experience outside of PC. PC is by far the most supported platform, and it shows. I know the developers are making steady progress, and they're always super friendly, so I feel for them on this seemingly never-ending catch-up with bugs and features. I just hope that the Switch version gets fixed soon, since I think it's a great platform for Armello that I play on quite frequently. As far as features go, the game would really benefit from things like a replay system, difficulty or personality settings for AI, a 2 vs 2 mode, new skins, and an improved menu UI that factors in the mixed feedback from patch 2.0. All that being said, the base game is still only $20, and even just the single-player skirmish mode is honestly really enjoyable for the price, as there's plenty of variety there. The multiplayer is generally excellent both online and especially when playing with our awesome community here via Discord and my Twitch channel. The DLCs are all extremely well designed too, and add further replay value and variety. My personal favorite is the Bandit Clan, but I'd be curious what yours is too. Scarlet is just so versatile, and also in my opinion, a pretty fitting leader for Armello. I'm also a huge fan of Barnaby, the Swiss army knife hero with a face that you can trust. I think all of this just speaks volume for how good the general gameplay is in Armello, when it can be lacking in so many other areas and still be considered an amazing game. The art style is fantastic, the sound effects are great, the gameplay is phenomenal, and I keep coming back to it over and over. Armello is a masterpiece of strategy RPG design, and a very unique experience. Overall, I give Armello the award for the best Game of Thrones political animal circus I've ever played. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Did you enjoy this tutorial slash overview? Are there any games that you've played that you think that fans of Armello might also enjoy? I'd also be curious if anyone is interested in more reviews, retrospectives, and tutorial videos, both for Armello and any other games that you can suggest. I've got a fairly large collection of them and more to come, as well as a remastered tutorial for competitive Pokemon. If you enjoyed watching this video, then feel free to subscribe for more content in a similar style. And I have some other game recommendations at the end and in the video description below. The production cycle for this one took almost six months and would not have been possible without your continued support on Patreon. So if you're interested in more content from me, it's always appreciated. 
as always, thank you so much for the support, and I look forward to seeing you all in the next video. Thank you for watching.